Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's CCAN webinar. My name is Lisa Fletcher, and I'm one of the three part-time CCAN Centre Managers. For those of you who are new to CCAN, CCAN stands for the Centre for the Evaluation of Complexity across the Nexus. For the past three years, we, we have been transforming the practice of policy evaluation across the food, energy, water and environmental domains to make it fit for a complex world. We have achieved this through pioneering testing and promoting innovative policy evaluation approaches with UK governments. To find out more about our work, please visit our website www.ccan.ac.uk. Today's webinar is about the human learning systems approach to managing in complexity. We are delighted to have Dr. Toby Lowe, Senior Lecturer in Public Leadership and Management at Newcastle Business School to present today's webinar. Toby's going to speak to us for around 45 <laughs> minutes, then we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Please submit your questions at any point via the question box, which you should be able to see on the Zoom webinar control panel. This webinar is being recorded and will shortly be made available on our CCAM website along with Toby's slides. I will now hand you over Toby to Toby for the presentation. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, folks. Um, as Lisa said, my name is Toby Lowe. I'm a, a senior lecturer in public management and leadership at Northumbria University. Um, uh, um, uh, but I'm a relatively recent um, a returnee to academia because um, I've worked for the uh, I've, I've been an academic I've been an academic for the last five years or so, and before that I worked in the public and voluntary sector for about fifteen years. So the the kind of things that I'm going to be presenting to you today come originally from a practitioner perspective, and then supported and developed through five years of uh, research work. How do we make that go? Ooh. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the human learning systems approach to managing in complexity. And there's a, uh, a kind of hashtag uh, around human learning systems if you want to join in with the um, uh, conversation that others have been having in, in this area. So what am I going to talk to you about? I'm going to give you uh, a little sense of what complexity means from our perspective. Uh, and, what, and what I think then complexity means for the task of public management. And I'm going to talk you through the human learning systems approach. And, and, and then I'm going to describe a little bit about the work that we're doing to try and build a movement for this human learning systems approach. Um, so I want to begin by kind of asking the question, why is complexity relevant? And, I think it's important to frame this uh, as the approach that we're taking is that complexity is a public management issue and a challenge for public management. And so this is a little different from um, some of the, uh, the ways that CCAN normally approaches this question because CCAN approaches Is this as, a, as an evaluation question normally, effectiveness of different policies when working in a complex environment. Um, we're asking a, a related question, which is how does working in complex environments affect the challenge of doing public management? And how do you need to do public management differently in order to uh, meet the challenges of complexity? And we think complexity is important to that, uh, uh, to that as an idea because it speaks to one of the fundamental challenges that public management seeks to address, which is we want to create better outcomes for citizens. But there is a kind of widely acknowledged sense now that the purpose of government and the purpose of public service is to improve the outcomes, the life chances, the lives of the people being served. And our assertion is that complexity is important because it helps to describe the fundamental processes by which the outcomes we care about are made. And so we're saying, if we fail to understand and embrace complexity, we won't be able to create the outcomes that we seek. Um, a, little world, a little word on how we know where enough is our complex. 
So some of those are uh, transactional. So for example, if I want to uh, renew my um, uh, car tax or uh, book a court at my local leisure centre, those are kind of simple transactional things. But significant amounts of public service, particularly as it relates to human service, it is in complex territory. And, and we can recognise that we're in complex territory when the people that are being served have a variety of strengths and needs and that those strengths and needs look different from different perspectives. Uh, we also know we're in complex territory when the outcomes that we care about are produced by many factors interacting together in an ever-changing way. So are, are there outcomes that we care about, the response uh, uh, produced by lots of different factors? And so if we take the outcome of well-being, right, what are, are, is that it is someone's well-being produced by a single lever that can be pulled, uh, a single organisation delivering a single programme, or are there many different factors working together to produce uh, uh, someone's well-being? Um, finally, we know when uh, we're in a complex system, when the people, when people are working in systems that are beyond the control of any one of those actors. So, uh, if again, if we take the example of well-being and the range of actors that might be involved in produce, in helping to develop someone's well-being might be themselves and their family and friends, a network of civil society organisations, uh, the NHS, uh, uh, both in its uh, primary and secondary care, uh, things that the local authorities do, things that the uh, private sector do in people's neighbourhoods. All of those actors contribute to an outcome like well-being and Though that range of actors aren't under the control of a single authority. So that's how we can tell when we're in a complex environment. How can we help visualise what complexity means for the, uh, uh, for the creation of the outcomes that we care about? And one of the um, uh, ways that we can help visualise this is through the um, uh, Obesity Foresight Systems Map. Amazing piece of work produced by public health uh, folk in 2007. Basically, what happens when you sh shut a bunch of public health people in a room and tell them they're not allowed out until they've identified all the causes of obesity and all the relationships between all of those causes? Uh, they, they said there were 108 different causes, and you can't see the kind of individual factors and the individual relationships in this diagram, but you can see. But what this demonstrates as a whole is the outcomes that we care about, like in this case obesity, are the product of a whole system working together. They're not the product, they're not produced by particular programs or organizations or particular interventions. So for the outcome of obesity, we can see that um, food production and supply, education, media, technology, the nature of work, the built environment, early life experiences, and healthcare and treatment options all go together to create the outcome of obesity. But if we look at the bottom right hand corner of this map, we can see that it's healthcare and treatment options. These are the things that government or charitable foundations would seek to fund or commission to address the outcome of obesity. So we can see what a small uh, aspect of those 108 factors are actually contributed by the services and interventions that we would deliver to address these things. And this has a really, really significant implication for how we do uh, performance management in the public and voluntary sectors. Because we've been seeking to hold, at uh, the last kind of 15 years or so, we have sought to hold organisations and programmes accountable for producing outcomes. But, uh, but what complexity says is that that approach doesn't work because outcomes are not delivered by organisations at all. As we've seen from this previous slide, the outcomes we desire are emergent properties of complex systems. And this realisation, the challenge that complexity makes to public management, has significant implications for how we think public management needs to be done. So then what does complexity require of us in a public management context? Well, it seems to require that uh, organisations, public services uh, must be able to respond to variety because each person's strengths and needs are different. 
So if we're looking to create an outcome in a person's life, we need to be able to understand their particular strengths and needs in order to respond to those effectively. Secondly, it requires the ability to adapt to change because we know that complex systems are dynamic. They're, they're constantly changing and they're constantly changing in unpredictable ways. So the context in which social interventions are undertaking also constantly changes. And finally, it requires uh, the ability to shape systems whose behaviour can't be reliably predicted and, who, and which no one controls. So these are the challenges to public management that complexity seems to require. So how do we go about meeting those challenges? Well, this is the work that we've been doing essentially for the last kind of three or four years. Uh, and we, um, we kind of first published something in a practitioner space in this in May 2017. That's the, the purple report on the left called A Whole New World, which described the, uh, we did research with different charitable foundations and public sector commissioners on how they were uh, responding to the challenges of complexity and how they were doing that through funding and commissioning differently. And then we were able to follow that up in May this year um, with a report on expo called Exploring the New World, which um, uh, gave greater depth to our understanding of that funding and commissioning practice and also allowed some insights into organisations that were delivering work on the ground effectively to complexity. So, and it's insights from this um, second report, Exploring the New World, that I want to share with you today. And through the process of listening to organisations who are working in this complexity informed way, we were able to develop a language for a kind of, which outlines the key elements of responding to complexity uh, in a pub, uh, by doing public management differently. And what they're saying is that to fund, to commission and to manage in complexity requires a human learning systems approach. So it requires being human to one another. It requires continuous processes of learning and adaptation. And it requires uh, acting on the understanding that it's systems that produce outcomes. And so I'll talk through each of these key areas in turn. So firstly, human. Um, we couldn't spend more than 10 minutes with any of the organisations working in this way before someone said to us something like, well, this is just about being more human to each other, isn't it? And we thought that that was a really interesting um, uh, response and really interesting that so many of the organisations talked about it in this way. But obviously, being academics, we wanted to kind of dig into this idea of what, what does being human mean in this context? Because it's an, idea, it, it's an idea that can have many different interpretations. So through digging into it, what it seemed to mean is um, that uh, the people were using the acronym VEST that they wanted that the work they were doing responded to the variety of human need and experience because they said if we're going to respond to um uh to people in a human way we need to understand the variety of ways in which people are human so we need to understand that uh, creating well-being in my life looks different to creating well-being in yours and yours and yours and yours and, and if we're going to understand the different uh, human variety, we need to be able to have empathy, to understand what it likes, or what it looks like to live the life of another. Uh, and firmly, further, it means we need to view people from a strengths-based perspective, because when a person comes to a, a public service, they're not just the way that that public service wants to define them. So they're not just a person with obesity problems or a person with mental health problems or a person with a housing issue. They are a whole person with their own full rounded lives and strengths as well as needs. And so in order to help those, that person in their variety, we need to understand them as a fully rounded human being. And finally, it seemed to mean trusting people in the work. Because in a complex environment, the only people with enough knowledge to make good decisions about the nature of the social intervention 
are the person themselves, the people receiving the service, and those workers who have a strong enough relationship with them to uh, really understand their variety and their strengths. And so that means if you're going to do effective public service, you need to be able to trust the people who are in the work to make effective decisions. So, best, variety, empathy, strengths, and trust. And what does this, what does taking this kind of best, this human approach mean for different actors in public service systems? Well, for, for funders and commissioners, it means providing long-term funding, so moving away from kind of short-term contract cycles. It means funding without performance measures, no KPIs, and providing core or kind of in technical terms, unrestricted funding to the organisations that are supported. Not unrestricted in terms of the amount, unrestricted as in we are not delimiting what this, what this money can be used for. Um, and we, we know that this is important because you cannot if you're um, a funder or commissioner, specify KPIs well enough from the distance that you have from the work to uh, create KPIs that don't undermine that work, make it more difficult to do and make it less effective. So the, all, the, the public managers working in this way fund and manage without those restrictive key performance indicators because they recognize that it just gets in the way and makes the work harder. And this manifests, for example, in the work of the Plymouth Alliance, which uh, is a commission created by their local authority and the cl clinical commissioning group to support uh, adults with complex needs in Plymouth. And this is an 80 million pound 10 year contract with public money. And they've created this without targets, no key performance indicators. Um, instead, what they're using is um, uh, a trust-based process where they have developed trust with organizations over a period of four years and they are holding organizations accountable for how effectively they collaborate together and how effectively they learn so that we know this alternative approach is possible and possible at a large scale uh, with public resources so if that's what it means for funders what does it mean for action on the ground well for uh, what it means is that um, the kind of public service is bespoke by default. So the purpose of public service is to understand that each human being is recognised as having their own strengths and needs, and the job of the end public service is to hear and understand what those strengths and needs are through forming effective relationships with people, and then respond appropriately to whatever those strengths and needs are in order to help achieve the desired purpose. And Mark Smith, the Director of Public Service Reform at Gateshead Council, describes this as a process of liberating workers from attempts to proceduralise what happens in good human relationships and instead focus on the capabilities and context which enable those relationships. So you'll see from this that this being human is a process of letting go of managerial control because there's a recognition that the attempts to managerialise and control what workers do makes things worse and makes public service more expensive. So that's the human element, learning then. So basically what the people doing this work saying, what we're saying is that um, uh, learning is the engine for performance improvement in, in this new version of public management. And the way that's uh, helpful to uh, really articulate and understand this is how it's different to the current view of learning. Because in, in our current uh, uh, view of learning, learning is still important, um, but it's recognised more as a phase in the social innovation cycle. So you might recognise the Young Foundation Stages of Social Innovation diagram. It's not, uh, it's quite old now, um, but this was the kind of one of the original attempts to articulate the kind of role of learning and innovation in a public service context. So it starts with a problem, number one, the prompt in their diagram, and then people learn and experiment in response to that problem. They make proposals, they do prototypes. And through that process of learning and experimentation, they find what works at a programmatic level, and then they do more of that. So that's the process of scaling, sustaining and scaling and systemic change in, that, in this perspective. The only trouble is that in a complex environment, that's just the not, not the right strategy, it won't work. 
they won't work because in a complex environment, learning is a continuous process. Because in a complex environment, there is no such thing as what works at a programmatic level, because what works is always changing. Because at any intervention that quote unquote worked, worked partly because of its relationship with its, with its context, with its broader system. And because those complex systems are dynamic and ever changing, that means that what works is always dynamic and changing. So the only appropriate strategy in response to that is that what works is the continuous process of learning and adaptation. So that means for funders and commissioners, they, they need to sh shift from uh, a perspective where their job is to purchase evidence-based, standardized uh, programs that they know to work. That doesn't work in a complex environment. The job of funders and commissioners in this is to purchase the capacity for organizations to learn and adapt, because it's the process of learning and adaptation that will keep what works working. And this is the kind of difference between intended learning and emergent learning. So in intended learning, uh, that situation where we know what good looks like and the job of, the learn, of, of uh, those learning uh, is to, uh, th those creating a learning environment is to say, we know what good looks like, we want you to know what that good looks like as well. In emergent learning, what good looks like keeps changing. And so the process of learning is a process of learning for everyone where we all need to keep up. And this is uh, work done by, her, by Sahana Chattopadhyay, um, and she identifies the, um, uh, some of the key practices of emergent learning. Uh, I, I won't go through this in detail, but um, it's worth uh, talking about the role of sense and sense making and reflective practices briefly, because what this says is this talks about a new role for evidence in complex environments, whereby evidence doesn't tell you what program you need to do. But evidence is instead used as a sense-making tool by people working on the ground as part of their reflective practices. And we know uh, from the organisations doing this a little bit about um, how these processes of learning are enabled. So firstly, uh, they're enabled by funding for learning, not funding for results. Uh, and secondly, by creating a learning culture in organisations and in systems. Uh, and particularly in systems, this means removing competition within those systems, because when you create competitive environments, organisations treat learning as part of their unique knowledge and part of their unique selling point. And so then they protect that knowledge from others in the system. Uh, it's really important to create a positive error culture so that's just that means creating an environment where people talk about mistakes and uncertainty because in a complex environment people are bound to make mistakes and people are bound to feel uncertain about what to do and so in order to enable learning we need to create environments where talking about mistakes and uncertainty is viewed as a positive thing amongst groups of peers. And finally, uh, say a little word about using data to learn, because it's uh, the role of measurement in um, uh, these uh, in this kind of human learning systems approach is really significant. Um, and so, uh, but the role of measurement changes. So instead of using data for accountability, so this is the uh, the idea that we, um, for example, we demonstrate our impact to others. Instead of using data for that kind of accountability, we use data to learn. And this is a really important distinction because we know that you can't use the same data both for learning and for accountability. And we've known this since 1979, Campbell's Law, which if I had my way, would be pinned to the desk of every, so every single person doing a social intervention or public service anywhere in the UK. So Don Campbell, professor, he's an American social science professor, wrote a very famous essay in 1979 called Assessing the Impact of Planned Social Change. In it, he identified Campbell's law. The more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures, the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it's intended to monitor. So, we cannot use the same data for accountability as we, can, as, as we do for learning because uh, if we try and use that data for accountability, it will have been subject to corruption presses and it will distort the processes that it thought it was monitoring. So, 
we need to make a decision about what we're measuring for. So that's human and learning. And finally, systems. Um, uh, so this start, the systems element of this comes from the, um, uh, the insight that we're looking at the obesity slide, that the outcomes that we care about are emergent properties of complex systems. And so then the, the key um, uh, uh, assertion that comes from that is that healthy systems produce good outcomes, or at least better outcomes. And that leads to two key questions. But if it's healthy systems produce good outcomes, firstly, who's looking after the health of the system? And by health of the system, I mean, how, e how easy is it for the actors within, within the system to coordinate and collaborate together? How easy is it for them to do that? And so who is asking how healthy is our system? Who is enabling actors in the system to be able to coordinate and collaborate? This was one of the key questions that people working in this human learning systems ask, and it's a key uh, question for the role of leaders in a human learning system approach. And we, we were able to, kind of following the Institute for Government, we were able to call this approach system stewardship. So there is a role within this of system steward, the person or people who is looking after the health of the system. So then what do these system stewards do? Because this is a, the, the, the second question that leads on, uh, which is, okay, if someone's looking after the health of the system, what does a healthy system look like? And we've got different um, avenues of exploration for this. So uh, one avenue for exploration comes from the work of uh, the Lanco Chase Foundation. They brought together a range of organizations that they were funding to do place-based systems change and a range of kind of thinkers and actors in this space to develop what they call system behaviours, as in these are the behaviours we would expect to see in a system that is functioning well for adults who experience severe multiple disadvantage. So I won't go through all of these, but they say things like, in a system that's functioning well for people who experience severe multiple disadvantage, people view themselves as part of an, inter of an interconnected whole. So um, people who are part of the system Working, which works towards those outcomes, recognise that they're part of the system and recognise the other actors in the system. Uh, they also, uh, what some of the other uh, behaviours they um, recognise were about power. So in a, in a healthy system, power is shared and equality of voice is actively promoted. In a healthy system, accountability is mutual. You begin to see how these uh, behaviours uh, uh, indicate what a healthy system might look like. So questions for people who are kind of playing that system stewardship role. Who are the relevant actors in the system? Do those actors recognise it as a system? And what's the relationship between those actors? So these are some of the kind of starting questions that uh, um, a system steward might ask. And how do you know what the state of play is in your system if you are uh, a system steward? Do you know whether your system is healthy or not? So quite frequently I get uh, asked about uh, accountability in human learning systems context. So how, do we, how, uh, how does accountability work if you can't hold people accountable for results anymore? Because holding people accountable for results doesn't make any sense in a, in a complex environment. So uh, and we don't fully know the answers to these, the question yet. So this is part of how the organisations doing this approach are experimenting with it. But we know a kind of a couple of key things. Firstly, we know that we haven't got accountability in our system, in our current system, because the process of target setting doesn't create accountability. The process of target setting creates gaming. We know this from a ton of research. Secondly, um, we can identify the types of experiments with accountability that people are doing within the human learning systems approach. So we can say that the people are experimenting with a form of accountability. So accountability as dialogue rather than accountability as reporting. So accountability as an ongoing conversation between someone asking for an account of what did you do and why did you do it and uh, those who are rendering action in that system. And secondly, we know uh, within these experiments that people are uh, experimenting with a, different, with a variety of who gets to participate in that accountability dialogue. So um, 
uh, it's not just uh, a hierarchical relationship between kind of a line manager and person working or someone who has had some power and devolved it to, a, to another. Um, there is also uh, horizontal dimensions of accountability, so groups of peers holding each other to account in accountability dialogues. Uh, so if I'm a doctor on a ward, uh, um, uh, I would have accountability conversations with my colleagues, uh, the other doctors, the nurses, the orderlies, about uh, why I did a particular set of, uh, of actions. Um, I might also have accountability conversations with the patients or the families of patients. This is why I recommended this course of treatment rather than another. Uh, I might have uh, accountability conversations with my professional body. This is why I... Uh, uh, chose this particular course of treatment rather than another, even though this one is uh, what's recommended. Uh, I might have accountability conversations with my line manager or auditor. Um, this is why I chose the expensive treatment rather than this cheap one. All these different forms of accountability uh, 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 are important. And so who gets to participate in the accountability dialogue expands? And um, thirdly, what counts as evidence within accountability conversations changes because we seem to have squashed the idea of accountability to, to, to just mean counting. Now we need to stretch it again to mean providing an account. And that means that qualitative evidence, qualitative evidence is just as important as quantitative evidence. And finally, what we're holding people accountable for seems to change. Um, uh, people experimenting with holding others accountable for learning. So asking the question, for example, what does your practice look like? Uh, what, how is your practice different now than it was 12 months ago? And if people answer, well, it's just the same, then maybe you want to ask some further questions. And also we hold uh, leaders accountable for the health of the system. So we hold our leaders accountable for how easy it is for actors to coordinate and collaborate, or for example, whether those nine Langkali Chase system behaviors are present or not. Um, we've been able to articulate this uh, uh, kind of work of system stewardship and this process of change to adopting a human learning systems approach um, in a kind of life cycle of, uh, of change, so the ways in which people have adopted this practice. And, and it kind of it, it begins with a conversation about purpose. So what's the purpose of the system that we're looking at? Um, and um, uh, then goes through a process of understanding the system. So making that system visible to the people, to the actors within it, building relationships and trust between them, establishing shared purpose. And that might have to go around that particular phase of work several times. But then that will hopefully generate some shared principles and values, which allows people to go into a co-design phase. What work should we do? Which creates experiments for people to try out with different forms of intervention and action within that system. And then those experiments um, uh, uh, can be embedded and then influence the system further, which means that we need to go around again to understand the system and make it visible more. And at the heart of all this, is a process of governance as learning. So the, the idea that um, it's learning that drives this, uh, us around this circle, this continuous process of asking the question, is what's happening here what we intended? What should we do next? And who are we to be making these decisions? So in, when we support people to kind of adopt this approach, we take people through this initial phase, how would you understand the system's de facto, de facto purpose? And then how would you gather actors together so that you can understand, understand the system better? So that was a very quick run through what the kind of human learning systems approach looks like as a, as a public management response to complexity. And what we're seeking to do with this is to build the movement for this practice so that in five years time when public managers are kind of developing a new program or there's a new government initiative launched or blah, 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 whatever, um, uh, they think, yeah, why wouldn't we use a human learning systems approach as opposed to a new public management approach, for example. Um, and so what we're doing to try and do that is we're undertaking research into what human learning system practice looks like and what it looks like in different contexts. So, um, for example, we, uh, uh, we've got a three-year research program funded by the Tudor Trust, and they are being a, um, uh, a subject uh, uh, of this research, asking 
how can we be a better human learning systems funder? And so they're reviewing their grant making and grant management processes and their relationship with grantees in light of this and conducting experiments in new practice um, to see how they can become uh, a more effective HLS funder. Uh, there are organisations asking what are the implications for voluntary community sector organisations. So uh, the IVAR, the Institute of Voluntary Action Research, are just about to start a research project kind of focusing on what this way of working means for voluntary sector organisations. There are a whole range of places experimenting with human learning system practice. So just to give you a kind of uh, a smattering Plymouth and Liverpool and Nottingham and Surrey and Gloucestershire and the organisations like Cornerstone and Mayday Trust, many, many more experimenting with this practice to find out what it looks like in different contexts. And also the organisations to exploring what new funding approaches look like. So uh, Save the Children, they've just produced a, a, a piece of research that uh, looks at what funding for system change looks like. A shocker have just uh, published um, work in that area as well. And then there's the losing control movement, which is kind of exploring these different funding and commissioning approaches. And if you are interested in this kind of approach, what can you do? How, how, how can you become part of this movement? Well, we'd, re we'd really like you to join in if, if this, any of this resonates with you. Um, and kind of the simplest thing that you can do is use the language of human learning systems approach because this, this is a paradigm shift happens the more people join in with it. And the more people using that kind of conceptual tools, the more people asking the questions that a human learning systems approach asks, that's how change happens in, these, in, this, in this world, we think. Secondly, you can act as a champion for it. You can, how, how might you be able to use your positional leverage, your authority, your relationships to work with others to, uh, to start experiments in this, with this approach? And you can explore funding and managing in a human learning systems way. And so within your context, where would you start? With this what what's the um what's a suitably sized experiment that would enable you to say do you know what we're going to try doing this public management a bit differently we're going to try an experiment with this program or with just this neighborhood or whatever and finally you can join with others and um, because there's a whole uh, kind of community of practice developing around this so uh its most obvious form is the uh, complexities group on the knowledge hub site where there's, uh, I think last count, there was 320 leaders from across the world um, who uh, are asking each other questions in the forum, who are, uh, there's a resource library. So uh, if you want to see the uh, tender documents that Plymouth used to commission uh, 80 million pound program with no KPIs, you can see how they did that there. Uh, and there's a, and as I said, there's a forum where leaders can ask one another questions of the, how on earth did you do that? Sorry. Um, thanks for listening, folks. I think now we've got some good time for questions. Hi, Toby. Yes, um, we've had a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first one that we've got is, aren't all forms of assessment subject to gaming, whether target-based or dialogue-based? Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. So, um, the, um, there is a potential for gaming, as you say, there is a potential for gaming any form of assessment process. But the um, the response to that within an, uh, the organizations have been doing within a human learning systems context is to say well if you've got a, if we've got a process of mutual governance governance that is about learning together then attempting to gain that system means that the collective work that everyone has signed up to is less effective and it ends up costing the organizations who do the gaming more money so by bringing that process into a um, uh, kind of horizontal governance mechanism, people are kind of experimenting with different types of, um, uh, uh, of dialogue, uh, different types of accountability mechanism around that. We don't know exactly what the results of that will look like. And, and one of the things that we're really looking out for in the research that we're doing is exactly 
is gaming popping up again, but in different places? The next question, how would the human strength stroke needs aspect work in practice in a, society, in a societal system where the number of individuals is very high, even millions, as is presumably the case with food obesity system? Um, so the, uh, the, um, the, that kind of relational way of working is increasingly recognised as the, um, the way to do kind of human services things, even at scale. So like the, uh, the question is, it, it create, sorry, it creates a couple of questions. Firstly, um, how many workers do you need to ha uh, have effective relationships with the people that you need to serve? So this is, it's partly a kind of caseload question for organizations wanting to work at this scale. Um, and secondly, uh, organizations working in this way um, at scale ask the question, do we, is it just our workers that can have the effective human relationships that, are, that seem to be genuinely transformational here? And um, how are, how can we form networks of support relationships amongst people themselves within the communities of which they're part that serve similar function to these um, uh, transformational worker citizen worker citizen relationships? So, the um, uh, the four kind of human services responses those two quest those two ways of working seem to enable people to do that the, that kind of relational approach at scale we have one more question um, please do feel free to add your questions in the question and answer box on the control panel as i've said that two more have come in next question what kind of research paradigm what kind of ontological and epistemological approach do you, advocate, yeah. do you advocate, Toby, for carrying out research in HLS? HLS. Um, so uh, I'm a kind of I'm a big fan of um, David Burns' kind of uh, complex critical realism. Um, essentially, a kind of epistemological position that the uh, the world is partly constructed by the way that we see it. Uh, but there is, that, there is also some world out there for us to engage with. Um, and this, that kind of complex critical realism perspective leads itself to, let's sorry, lends itself to kind of narrative based approaches to ethnography, to QCA, those kind of uh, method approaches um, uh, support, I think, the. Uh, kind of generating interesting learning material um, and there's also something significant in this about by what process does data get trans get transformed into knowledge for people because there's, re there's something really significant in our kind of research practice in this area when we're wanting to make um, these systems work better in that um, the knowledge has to be in the heads of the people who are doing the work. And that means that processes of sense making, so turning data into knowledge through, through sense making practices, have to be at least partially done by the people themselves. So uh, uh, one of the things I would encourage us to think about as researchers in this area are uh, who's doing the analysis of the work that we, that we present and how do we help create learning environments amongst practitioners so that it's partly them doing the analysis? Thank you. Next question. Has there been some assessment of the capacity strength skills needed when the organizations have to invest in before they move to the HLS approach? Oh yes, good question. So um, uh, there's, um, uh, Work that I know of in actually there's, there's two things I'd reference here. So um, uh, a kind of larger scale work, the work at University of Birmingham that uh, I think Catherine Needham was leading on the 21st century public servant is really relevant here. And so her work was uh, was basically 
as I understand it, saying that the 21st century public service needs more generalists and fewer specialists because we need people who have essentially have the ability to form effective relationships with people, understand and interpret evidence in context, and then apply that knowledge. So um, that, as a set, as a piece of work, um, helps us to understand a little bit about kind of what our workforce and skills needs are, um, and then. Uh, there's particularly work happening in Newcastle and Gateshead where people are looking at what is the what what does this translate into uh, workforce needs for the health and social care sector, um, and again, remarkably similar to what's coming out of that uh, 21st century public service work is um, the ability to to form effective purposeful relationships with human beings seems to be the one of the primary skills um that's required of uh kind of public servants in a human in the human services field and um the folks who are doing kind of analysis of this so far kind of particularly what they found in in gateshead's um gated council's work is that um Human beings are, uh, are mo for the most part really good at that, and we've kind of trained that out of people, and particularly trained that out of people in a professional context. But given the space and some kind of framing about what it means to be an effective human, uh, to form effective human relationships in that context, people can do it. So the uh, one of the 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 things that I've seen come out of kind of Gated Council's work on this is kind of good news. We don't have a skills gap. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. If I have a short amount of time with the local government senior manager to speak to about human learning systems, what would you recommend as my elevator pitch? <laughs> um, <ooh. laughs> nice. Um, uh, so that's a really good question. Um, uh, so you, the, um, the way I always start with this is to find out what their, like what their challenges are, right? Because it's hard to do an elevator pitch that has general applicability because you need to know what pressing that particular person's buttons. So, I mean, the... The overall pitch that I give around this is, um, are the problems that you're dealing with simple or complex? And people probably say that they're complex, because if, if, if they say they're simple, you can say, well, if they're, if they're simple problems, you probably have solved them already, right? So as soon as people recognize that the problems are complex, you can say, to, you can say well, is the approach that you're working, the kind of target-based approach that you're working, How's that working for you? Have you have you been able to do the things that you want to do based on the kind of your kind of target setting approaches for the last 25 years? Is that working? Again, they probably say no. They, well, we can offer you something different. We can offer you a way that seems to be produce more effective outcomes cheaper. That would be maybe my kind of elevator bridge because uh, you know, if you're looking for a kind of killer fact on this, um, uh, one of the things I reference frequently is the uh, Bertzorg, Bertzorg approach to um, uh, kind of adult health and social care in Holland, whereby uh, they have done this process of kind of liberating workers to form human relationships with people and then doing whatever it is that those people need. And uh, that approach has managed to cut social care costs in half in some cases, so 50% cheaper, while massively increasing both client and worker satisfaction. And I don't know many um, local authority senior managers that aren't interested in doing things 50% cheaper and get and them getting better at the same time. Um, the quid pro quo is that they what they need to give up is they need to give up the illusion that they're in control of this stuff. Great. A more simple question for you now. Do you have any materials for teaching this approach? It could be part of movement building too. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, so at the moment, our kind of material is the um, 
the report that we launched earlier this year and we're just we're kind of figuring out how to translate that into teaching materials because the thing to remember with all this is that it's um, whilst it's based on practice that has kind of emerged from all sorts of different places over the last 20 years the um the actual kind of naming of it and the bringing it together under an alternative public management story that's that's really really new so we're um we're attempting to understand how we would teach this stuff right now and if anyone has uh, uh would like to kind of join in with our kind of thinking around that and helping us to do that we will be very grateful thank you could you say something about the role of the public service leader in defining and managing the boundaries of the systems yeah nice yeah exactly so a, that's a really good question because um obviously one of the key challenges of systems work is that um eventually everything is related to everything else which is true but just not very helpful so one of the kind of key challenges for a public service leader in this is how do you bound a system effectively that innate, that makes it kind of tractable uh, for uh, improvement processes, right? Um, and this is where this idea of starting with purpose seems to have been quite a useful concept for the organisations that have done it. So asking the question, what is the purpose of the system that I care about? So you might answer that by saying we want to improve the well-being of vulnerable adults in Plymouth right that gives you a purpose for a system and once you have a purpose for a system you can then say okay which who are the relevant actors in that system and so uh, Plymouth Council and CCG for example were able to identify 26 different organizations that seem to be uh, organizations who did work on the ground who they thought contributed to that uh, uh, that particular purpose of achieving well-being for vulnerable adults, and uh, and then the people themselves, the, the people at the sharp end of those services, and so what they did was that they conducted a, an appreciative inquiry with all of those people that they were able to identify who they thought achieved that uh, were, were relevant to achieving that purpose, and they asked, "What's it like?" to try and do this work, to try and help uh, vulnerable adults thrive in Plymouth, or what it's like to be one of these people receiving services. And through that process of appreciative inquiry, they were then able to play all that back, that material back to all of those actors in the system in order to develop a, that, that system sense of, this is what it looks like from different perspectives in the system. And, by doing that work to develop that sense of oh, I always thought I always thought being a job and being a provider was really easy because we just they just respond to the tenders that we send them and blah, 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 blah. or wow as a provider I I never knew that this was uh, what a bunch of the um, uh, people that we serve thought about the service yeah the, that that work to develop the different perspectives in the system and um, will then uh, give you a sense of uh, help to reinforce that sense of um, who's in and who's out of that conversation. Because if you start asking people a question, they go, well, that's not relevant to me. Then you, you've probably drawn the bounds of your system far enough. I don't, I don't know whether that answered that question well or not. <laughs> Thank you. We've got um, mainly a comment, but it ends with a question. So bear with me. <laughs> Toby, you've made a great case for the HLS approach as a public management approach to complexity. And I think it's incredibly a fresh perspective on creating effective action on some big issues. I'm excited about its potential, but I think there are some big risks associated with throwing the evidence baby out with the bathwater, as it seems here. Taking the obesity issues in your slide, don't the system stewards at global, national and local level want to know if the system changes are helping to bring about real change for different types of people in different contexts. Isn't it important for system stewards to know what is actually going on when the stewards are responsible for such large sums of money? For sure, monitoring is subject to gaming, but good quality evaluative research at a system level is vital to ensure that the public select committee's politicians are able to hold the system stewards accountable. 
I'd like to know how open you are to exploring approaches to evaluation that works with complexity. Oh, uh, yes, really good points. Um, uh, and the, the short answer is, uh, to the, the question at the end is absolutely really open. Like we've seen some of the um, uh, kind of complexity informed evaluation approaches um, being used in different contexts. Um, and um, that, that question that uh, the, the, the person identified of what's useful information to system stewards at different levels about the state of play with their system is exactly right. I, I think that's exactly the right question. But there was a little there was a little move made there, and this is the this is this is the move that I think complexity breaks from uh, system stewards need, need that information about the state what's going on in their system, and there's all sorts of different versions of that. But what um, uh, the move that, the, uh, that I think complexity breaks is to say. And then, therefore, we should hold those system stewards accountable for results within that system. And that's, that's, that's what complexity says is unfeasible. So, obviously, we can hold people accountable for results, but when you do, it doesn't work. And there is, like, every single study of when you try and hold people accountable for results in complex systems produces the same results. That is, it, it creates a situation in which people gain the system and which no one tells the truth to each other anymore. So... Uh, uh, what we what's important to explore is what can we hold our leaders, our system stewards accountable for in this in this in in that kind of context, right? And that is absolutely an open question that warrants exploration. So, for example, um, it would be crazy to hold the um, a minister associate for a, a kind of Home Office minister um, responsible for the level of crime in an uh, uh, environment because there are too many factors too out of their control <coughs> the, to say we um, would hold our uh, Home Office Minister accountable for uh, levels of recorded crime. Right? That, would, that, that would be a crazy thing to do. But we could hold our uh, Home Office uh, Minister accountable for, say, um, underfunding of a prison system which let a uh, prison and probation system which left um probation workers with uh caseloads where they weren't able to form effective relationships with people because that's something where uh we can say i think we probably could get reliable evidence about what a decent caseload is for a uh probation worker that's uh, that enabled them to have effective relationships with uh with cases and if uh, a Home Office Minister isn't able to put enough funding into uh, that enables that to work, and yet we would hold them accountable for that. So that's just kind of an example of some of the edges of that kind of accountability question and where, what the role of evidence is. But yes, it would be great to explore that with people. <laughs> Another question to come in, I think we've got time for this one. Um, can you talk a bit about how this work would work alongside government's requirement to do post-implementation reviews where a simple linear description of causality is necessary in order to do a cost-benefit analysis of the policies implemented. So this, uh, we'll know when the human learning systems approach is winning when people don't do that because those two things, those two processes are fundamentally at odds. So they are from different paradigms. So, uh, um, uh, and I would suggest that uh, the idea of doing that kind of cost benefit analysis of a particular policy implementation only works if you're working in a simple environment. As soon as you, you say this environment is complex, doing that approach makes no sense. Will and will produce. I, I can't see how that can produce useful answers. Thank you, Toby. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. As I mentioned earlier, we will be adding the recording and the slides to our website in the coming days. You will receive an email to confirm when they are available. Thank you all for attending and thank you, Toby, for hosting the webinar. Goodbye, everyone, and I hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much.